as a young fella, you, you're 20 years or 21 years old, you just left your mother <laughs> who told you what to do, to wipe your nose or whatever else, and you got told to where to go and wipe your nose by these corporal sergeants and so on. You're in the army, you're told what to do all the time, everywhere. The war ended. Now we're not going to be told what to do. Now what? Now what happens now? The Second World War ended on September 2nd, 1945. It had lasted six years and one day. During the conflict, approximately 233,000 men and more than 17,000 women served in the Royal Canadian Air Force, with more than 17,000 losing their lives. At war's end, Canada laid claim to the world's fourth largest air force. I'm very upset because I thought, I thought my number was due because somebody else's number came up and my, I had a lower number. So I went to the sergeant and I said, uh, they didn't call my number. He says, so what? Whatever he said. And I said, well, can you tell me? And he says, what's your number? And I, R266054. He pulls the paper and he says, it's not on here. I says, well, when am I going? I haven't any idea. We'll call you. So that was it. Nobody knew when you were going. So when I did hear, I was told that I would more than likely not go home till spring. So I spent a good part of a year on the continent working at headquarters and waiting to go home, which was, you know, the war was over. I had no patience. None of us had patience. You know, the question was, well, what do we do now? The station commander wanted to keep control over, the, over us in case we didn't go too wild and so on, and the partying a bit. So he organized sports days. That kept, that kept us busy and, out of, and occupied and so on. It was a smart move. After the war was over in Europe, uh, they had thousands of us in England that they didn't know what to do with. So they had holding units. When I was there about two weeks or so, uh, I was told that I was now the new stage electrician for an RCAF show that was traveling in Europe and everything else. I had the best six months of my Air Force career right there. We felt important, you know. Yeah. Everybody knew there was a, a show in town and they were gonna play a performance tonight. It was a variety show. And we did like uh, the opening number with sort of like a tap routine. We did one where we dressed up like cowboys, cowgirls. Yeah, we did different types of uh, dancing. This was our opening number. And we had these jackets on that shone in the dark. It was black. See, the first show was blackouts, and we were all clear. So that we had this costume on in this jacket, and somebody yelled, all clear, and the curtains open, and we're just in these teddies and the black stockings. Well, the whistles and the hoots and the howls were so, <laughs> were so loud that we couldn't hear the music. <laughs> so they changed the costumes. <laughs> Oh yes, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. Uh, it was the best time there was, and we were treated so well, you know. 
you hear of girls joining up into the armed forces, their parents wouldn't let them go because they figured there'd be a lot of hanky-panky or whatever they thought was going on. Nothing like that at all. Where are the props? No propellers. It's a jet fighter. Hmm. I knew they were testing towards the end of the war. No propellers, eh? What will they think of next? No pilots. That'll be the day. <laughs> Good to be back home, Johnny. It's not easy, I'll tell you that. It took a while, waiting and waiting and then more waiting. Lots of blanket drills in between. Blanket drills? Naps, Andy, naps. They didn't discharge me when they did. I was gonna snatch up my old lank, fly back to Canada on my own. <laughs> Can't wait to get home, man. No, could you? Couldn't wait to see my girl, my mom, my pa, my brothers and sisters. But, uh, but what? I think I'm gonna miss... Miss your old crew, right? Yeah, them for sure, but... There's something about the fighting. About cheating death. The rush of it all. I'm gonna miss that. But now you have your whole life ahead of you. That's what I'm scared of, Andy. Seems a lot scarier than what I'm leaving behind. I wonder why that is. We were glad to be home. The next morning, we arrived at Central Station in Montreal. And my whole family was there. My mother, my father, my sisters. I was coming home. My God, what a joy. It was a moment that we'll never forget. Well, it was nice to get home. It was kind of a letdown, though, because the excitement was over. The war is over. <laughs> when we landed in Canada, they had a big band playing and all that. We all got off. And the the people were all there at uh, New Brun or Nova Scotia, and uh, there was a there was a train on the tracks right there, and so there was a one of the guys that look after each cabin or whatever you want to call it. There would be about twenty guys on that one section. We'd all have a single single seat. When we went overseas, there would be three guys in that seat, and you had no papers. Here we got. Where are you from, Toronto? Here's the Toronto paper, you know. And so they'd say, uh, when it came time we went to sleep at night, those things made into a bed for us so we could sleep. He would say, go down to the end of the room and have a smoke. And you can get a beer down there and I'll make your, your beds. And I said, well, we can make our beds. He said, no, 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 that's my job. And he was an elderly man, so he made the beds. And he says, I want you to leave your shoes out here so I can shine them for you. I said, are you joking? <laughs> Nobody ever shined. I says, I want you to do that. He says, look at me. I never went to the war. I want to do something for you guys. I could cry when I hear things like that. Anyways, we would have, we would go to a special cabin or, or train for, for, to eat. That never happened before. They'd say, what do you want? Three, four eggs, six eggs? How many do you want? How do you want them cooked? You know, and the cook would say, it's, it's so, he wants them done this way, just lightly over. He says, okay, how, how about the bacon? How many bacon do you want? You know, do you like it this way or that way? And toast. Oh, he knows how to make, and they, they just, you'd, you know, it would be running down your cheeks. You'd just say, my God, you know, like, but that was the war was over. We were home. And you know, we were saying, geez, they never had that. We never had milk, never had butter, never had, you know, jam or anything like that. So landing home was just, it was home. We knew it. Getting home though was, was kind of interesting because I had phoned mom from, from Ottawa and I said, oh, I think I can probably make the, the own sound 
or the Alford train goes up from, from Toronto. When it was due to arrive, the whole village was out to, to greet me. And of course, somehow I couldn't make that, that train and I didn't phone. Or, but I hitchhiked up from, from uh, Toronto. It was the day after when I got up there. And uh, our place had a long lane, the country lane, you know. He drove me up the lane and, and, uh, and stopped and, and I got out. And mum was there on the porch waiting for me. Yeah, it was great. Mm. Settling into home life, getting back to the old routine, eh? Everyone's been great. When I first got home, there were lots of pats on the back, you know? Parade for those of us who fought, free drinks, that sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, life goes on. And some of the vets I met, they have their whole lives mapped out for them. All types of government assistance to help them out. But to tell you the truth there, Andy, I'm kind of in the soup. Like I'm flying through a dense fog all the time. I'm jumpy when it comes to loud noises. On edge all the time. I don't sleep well. Wish I were over there, so I wouldn't have to think about it all the time. I just want to fly missions. That's what I'm good at, flying missions. That's what I do. You did, Johnny. That's what you did. You know, you might have what they call PTSD. PT what? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Those are some fancy $5 words you're spitting out there, Andy, in English. PTSD is a mental disorder some veterans get from fighting in wars. No. <laughs> no. I'm not a nutcase. It's not what I'm saying. It can be controlled. Enough. We're done talking about it. I'll be. I'm fine, and don't you tell anyone, you hear me? I went to law school. And I stayed for a while, but I could see after, I couldn't settle down. I guess my mind was someplace else. So I, I left there and, and started to work. And I, finally I worked for Blue Cross. And then that eventually became OHIP. And I spent my working days with OHIP. So I went right back to university. And, and you know, they, uh, the Army supported my wife and me for the, till I graduated. So I walked into the Bell office in Montreal, a big recruiting office right inside the door. And I said, went over to the little girl and I said, you know, I was thinking of applying for a position. She said, well, what are your qualifications? I said, well, just the right words. I said, I'll just got my diploma from McGill. And uh, before that, I was in the Air Force, in radar. She said, is that and to do with wireless? I said, it's completely wireless. She says, well, we're looking for, for people with a university degree who, who have experience in wireless. <laughs> so she said, would you wait a minute? And so she went and got her boss, and he took me up to the, the big boss of the apartment they wanted me to go into. And he said, could you start tomorrow? And I said, well, maybe next week. And so I started the following Monday. And then 36 years later, I said, thank you, Raider, you got me in the door. I taught Morse code to the scouts at a time when women were not allowed into the scout troop at all. But because of the necessity for the boys to learn Morse code, I was permitted into the troop. Got home, um, 
went into the, to the university and uh, graduated as a, a civil engineer, and then right straight into work. I had been thinking of going to visit CETA and ask to see if there was, they might have something that I could do. And, and the very day that I was planning to see them, I got a call from, from this general saying, would, how would you like to go to Burma? <laughs> I thought about it a long time, one second, <laughs> and said yes. I um, went to De Havilland in uh, 1953, I think it was, 53. And uh, I was there until, until I went to join Ken Molson, who was a curator uh, in the National Aviation Museum. It was a wonderful time that um, when I first realized that this is what I wanted to do help to preserve airplanes and, and uh, in my own time, paint what I wished to paint, which was uh, aviation scenes of historic events in particular. Guess what? I'm flying again. That's great. Where? With who? I'm flying a busher for a hunting and fishing lodge. Oh, that sounds about right. Yeah. I'm taking rich muckety mucks up north so they can bag a bear or a moose and put a stuffed head on their mantelpiece and brag about it over whiskey and cigars. Sounds gross. Which part? The stuffed animal heads part. Who are we to judge? I'm just glad I found something. So many of them who are over there haven't. And some of them were real war heroes, chests full of medals. Now forgotten. When the war started, I was just a kid in the ninth grade. When the war ended, I was a lieutenant in the Air Force, a full-grown man, even if I was only 20 years old. When I looked around me, I thought I was pretty smart and pretty lucky. <laughs> I had seen London and Paris and, and Algiers and things like that, so... I was pretty full of myself when I came back. It wasn't hard to get me to talk about uh, what I'd seen. I don't like talking about the war as such, a killing and so on that went on. Uh, uh, that was our job. We did it. And, uh, and there was no question. We, we couldn't argue about it. We just did it. But the, the other part, the, Playing part was was great, and I, I told everybody about that. But I think as time goes on, people will forget. I think after the war was over, uh, the first world war was over, say in the twenties, people forgot that. Like they, like we have a tendency to forget our our last war here. The other thing is things are moving much faster now than they were twenty years ago or forty years ago, and people are. Much, much, uh, much busier doing other things. Well, it's been said, and it's true. History is 30 seconds ago. I want people to always remember that uh, the historical aspect of what they do and what other people do is important to preserve. When you think of it, the German people are human too. And it wasn't the German people who started the war. It was their leaders who felt they could have more land or create a greater presence in the world. But you meet German people now and they're just the same as you and I. I work with them at the senior center. They're great. Now that you're back and working, what do you miss most about the war? 
I miss my crew. The rest is fading, but my crew, we had some good times. Close shaves, too. We try to keep in touch, but I live up north and uh, they're all over the country. It's not the same. Probably will never be. No, probably won't. Best to put that robe behind us and move on. There's something though. Something worth repeating? That's not up to me, Andy. But who better to tell others why we should not have war than veterans? You think anyone will listen. War really doesn't solve anything in the, in the, in the final analysis. It's just a lot of people have their lives ruined and, uh, you know, are killed and maimed. And uh, I, I think there should be more emphasis on peace. The whole philosophy should be that, you know, war, war is bad. And uh, it, it, you have to, <clears throat> there was no doubt that our war had to be fought because uh, Hitler and Mussolini were going to take over the world. And they nearly did. But uh, there, is a, there is a point where you should be able to stop that ahead of time. I don't know what it is. Well. Love each other. <laughs> I think I love each other, I think I would say, because that solves everything. Love saves everything. <laughs> but uh, that's practically impossible. So I don't think that's, uh, that's going to happen. I realize that we have differences, but if we can only look at the other person's point of view, maybe would, we would avoid a lot of conflict and heartache. It's very difficult to constantly feel you are the only one who knows what's right. Just realize that listen to them, and then judge whether you are right or whether the other person might have a tiny bit of knowledge too. It would be nice to see the world become peaceful. Everybody started getting along with one another instead of having to fight with one another. Fight for peace. I think that's the only thing. War is a terrible thing. And as I said, we've, uh, we've lost thousands. Well, we've lost millions all together during the war, but it's terrible. And I would do everything to avoid it. Somebody who wants to conquer somebody and do it by, you can try to negotiate it and you can threaten but if they don't stop, you've got to stop it. And you should be prepared. And never be not prepared. And keep up your, your army, your air force, your navy. That's as much as I think I can say. You've got to be able to fight back got to be able to fight back. I thought, well, let's go back and live happily ever after. I really did. When I got home, I just, that's done. You know, I've been to a war. It's terrible, whatever, 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 but it's over. But we've had a war ever since. I hate it. You know, Andy, experience teaches you a lot of things in life. My only hope is that future generations will see what we did in this war, the sacrifices, the accomplishments, and 
they may learn something from it. Or else, it'd be all for naught, and that would be a shame. I believe they will, Johnny. I have a good feeling about it. That's good. What I would say to the veterans that I went through World War II, um, I would say, you know, you guys are awesome to be able to, you know, just drop everything because most of these people are high school students, you know, they were 19, they were 17 when they went off. To be able to, you know, say goodbye to your family, to be able to pack up and go fight this war for your country, I think that is something that's really cool because nowadays a lot of people don't really stand up for themselves, let alone a whole country. And for them to be able to do that and, you know, either survive or die in the battle, um, that is amazing that they have this tale to tell. So les vétérans, uh, rend la deuxième guerre mondiale. These veterans make the Second World War more authentic, closer to people. C'est vraiment comme des pilotes qui ont vécu. These pilots have seen a bomb bay door open above them and risked having 30 bombs drop on them if they didn't do something. They've been shot at have had to parachute down to survive when the rest of their crew died. Fait tirer puis qu'il faut qu'ils sautent en bas d'un parachute pour essayer de survivre puis le reste de son équipage meurt, c'est What happened during the Second World War is intense and I feel more connected to it now. Attaché maintenant. Listen to Mr. Jelinos interview, it just I feel like I know him now. Like I've I've never met the guy before but I feel as if I know him. It's kind of amazing. These guys and girls have some great stories behind them that need to be told or need to be put on record. And it would be a complete shame if they just got lost. I don't know, it's just something I find like fascinating just hearing all their stories, you know? Like, you can watch a movie or read a book, but uh, when you actually hear it from someone who's experienced it, it's totally different. They are only veteran stories. They're not some guy who read about these things in a book. These people have lived through it. It's real. It's honest. When they speak, you can feel the emotion in their voices and in their eyes. This is their actual lives. It's important for younger generations to never forget what uh, older generations did for us because we wouldn't be where we are. And uh, it's just important to know that war is not really a good thing and uh, a lot of people died and I hope it doesn't happen again. Once hearing about uh, all the stories from the actual people that lived through it, uh, it hits a lot harder and it makes you care a lot more about what happened. As I remember in high school, it was kind of, you know, basic learn, learn the dates, learn the locations, study for your exam, and that was pretty much it. Then just to sit there and to listen um, to everything that they have to say, you know, you get attached to these people, to these, you know, these fighters, even though, you know, some of them probably weren't, you know, they were just nurses or, you know, they were fighter pilots or just like the navigators. Each one of them has played an important role in our history. To be able to make an, an emotional connection with the person to tell future generations, I think that is a really cool thing and that, you know, I'm really thankful that they were there. Le fait que ces deux générations qui sont... You have two generations facing each other. On one side, a generation that lived through bombings and had to go to war. On the other side, a generation that's holding an iPhone and has everything at its fingertips. I think we have a lot to learn from these men and women. We need to take the time to give them a voice. We need to remember them. We need to pay attention to what they're telling us. A lot of veterans want to pass on what they know. We're losing more and more of them as time goes on. It's like our last chance to hear them tell their stories. Parce que on commence à en perdre de plus en plus. C'est comme notre dernière chance un peu. Young people need to understand the past in order to better understand what's going on today. Notre jeunesse doit comprendre le passé pour mieux comprendre ce qui se passe aujourd'hui. Just knowing about what these soldiers did, what the war was about, why it happened, 
would help educate the younger generation against having them happen again. History is something that should be remembered and never forgotten. They were young, as we are young. They served, giving freely of themselves. To them, we pledge, amid the winds of time, to carry their torch and never forget. We will remember them. We will remember them. <laughs>